man, I was blown away that the Comanches essentially, once they weaponized the horse, ruled the plains. Yeah. There's a list in there of, I think, two dozen tribes that they either drove to extinction or drove completely off the plains. Welcome to another episode of the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate. I've got my dad here with me. How are you doing? Good, man. Hi, guys. This is our official first book review episode, and we couldn't have a better book on hand to review. We've talked and thought a lot about how we want to do this, because if we review the book too thoroughly, that kind of spoils it. We don't want to, at the same time, not talk about it, because especially this book, it's there's a lot here, and so th- this story's been around a long time, and we're not going to spoil anything. No. Don't don't let that discourage if you. If you've ever read a Louis L'Amour book, you've probably kind of got a spoiler going on on the Comanches anyhow, a little bit, so we yeah. can't wreck it. Yeah, and the book is Empire of the Summer Moon by S.C. Gwynn, Quanta Parker, and the Rise and Fall of the Comanches, the most powerful Indian tribe in American history. And what we thought we would do with this one, and probably with most of our book reviews, is each take a turn, maybe make three points or thoughts or ideas that came to us either before or after reading. Talk about those more than the the story of the book. So we're going to bounce around is what I'm saying. Uh, and maybe I will give you a quick overview. It, it, this, is a, this is the true or this is a nonfiction story of the Comanche Indians and their rise and fall and their empire. And it focuses on several characters, both American settlers, um, some specific, uh, several specific Comanche Indians, politicians, uh, the state of Texas. Just it's kind of a, 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 a real beautiful patchwork of. American history and characters. The, the and country of Texas. The country of Texas, yeah. So, Yeah, it, it's a fabulous book. And first of all, so I don't know if you've ever done a book review, but I've never done a book review. No, I, exactly. Not since elementary school. Yeah. That, you know, and that was a book report. Yeah, yeah. That was a, I've done book reports, but <laughs> yeah. not book reviews. Yeah, so we know nothing of this, but we know a good book when we read it. And this has been just a, just a real captivating thing. Going into this, I have to sort of sheepishly admit that I knew basically nothing of the actual history of the settlers and the Indians besides watching Pocahontas, <laughs> watching uh, Dances with Wolves, and the the folklore of the Indians that was, you know, that's just part of our culture. And so I mentioned that because Dances with Wolves as a movie is one of my all-time favorites. I love it. And honestly, I felt like this book was a really great companion to that movie. It's almost like they took a lot of themes from true history, you know, with the the Indians um, kidnapping or taking white settler children and incorporating them into the tribe. I didn't realize that was a true thing that happened. But mm-hmm. in any case, that that movie paints a really beautiful picture of the of the Plains Indians. And I think in that movie, those Indians were Sioux Sioux Mm -hmm. and Pawnee. Yeah, who show up in this story a little bit. The the, the Sioux do sort of uh, parenthetically as sort of being sort of a counterbalance to the Comanches, but not quite. Nobody really was. But the Sioux and the Cheyenne kind of occupied similar space farther north. And they were were horse Indians. They They were were horse Indians. Indians who figured out horses, although nobody figured horses out the way the Comanches did. Nobody weaponized them like the Comanches did. They, they were, other tribes were eating them and trading them, but the Comanches were killing from them. Oh (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And other, so we'll, we'll talk about that as we dive in, but, but the fact is Comanches took horse culture further than any of the other horse culture tribes. The thing that rocked me is I kn- I thought I knew quite a bit about Indians. I, I, as a kid, I grew up absolutely seduced by the story of the fur trade and the story of of uh, cattle dr- stories of cattle drives and Indians and you know interaction between Indians and the Iroquois nation and you know Henry Joseph A. Altscheller wrote a, a, the Henry Ware series that I just devoured when I was nine, ten, eleven. I couldn't get enough, and then of course Louis L'Amour and 
and none, nothing was as uh, compelling to me as the journals of Lewis and Clark, which I didn't discover until I was probably 45 years old. Mm. So I, I loved that whole thing, but I was shocked at how little I appreciated or really understood the Comanches. What were some of your thoughts initially while you were kind of moving through the book? Well, the first thing was, and I've become sort of sensitive to this through my 40s and 50s and now 60s, that I love a book that includes footnotes. I, I just love the fact, and I don't check all the footnotes, but occasionally I look through them to see if anything glare, jumps out as an inconsistency or somebody trying to blow some smoke. And what I've learned is that an author who takes the time to put the footnotes in there to sort of su substantiate his research and his claims is probably someone that I can that I can let my guard down with a little bit. Yeah, you know. And this book has footnotes. You know, I mean, here's a guy writing what purports to be, and I think is in fact a pretty objective um, historical piece mm -hmm. about something that that just was so compelling to me because so much of it was new. It's a challenging thing to be a writer and he would occasionally quote, you know, words of the soldiers or the Indians that we do have written record of. Yeah. But the amount that he was able to I and I would say correctly extrapolate from their words yeah. and and sometimes you insert a little bit of not fiction but say something like the the pride on the Indian's face as he walked back into town was without right. compare. Right. Something that's fair and really helps paint the picture. But yeah. I remember at the time thinking like, since you're reading some nonfiction, like, well, how do we know he looked yeah. proud yeah, when yeah, he yeah. came in? Yeah, um, yeah. So the point is, this book is super easy to read because yeah. it reads like an it reads like a novel. Yes, it does. It hit like a darn good because novel. you're reading things like that, like the he he you know he was sadder than he had ever been, and yeah. it's kind of yeah. like okay, yeah, I, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, tough job to be an author. Footnote, document everything, and also make it fun to read and connect the yeah. dots and lead the viewer through these steps. And I thought he did a really beautiful job of that. Yeah. So in the, in the movie Lonesome Dove, I think it's Gus. Gus is the guy that, yeah, I think it's Gus. At some point, I remember some little clip where somebody starts shooting at him. They're Indians, they're hostiles. And when he looks at him, I remember him going, oh, Comanches, with a tone of real if not anxiety, because Gus never showed anxiety, right? But sort of resignation and, well, I better really lace up my boots because they're Comanches. And I thought, huh, you know, all the books mm -hmm. I'd read, Comanches just kind of, they received sort of a byline sort of a, of a emphasis. Man, I was blown away that the Comanches essentially, once they weaponized the horse, ruled the plains. Yeah. There's a list in there of I think two dozen tribes that they either drove to extinction or drove completely off the plains. Yeah. Um they were just utterly unstoppable. They it sounded like they used the horse as effectively as the Mongols. Yeah, that's Genghis what I Khan was and the boys. That's yeah. what I was thinking the whole time. Like that's the same advantage that the Mongols had over everybody else. They could fight from a horse and nobody else could. That's right. Nobody else could. And here is what appeared to me to be the, 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 the way to sort of quantify that is that the Comanches, alone of all the Indian tribes, rode geldings into battle. Okay. Is that a throwaway assertion? No, it's not a throwaway yeah, assertion. Give the background on what a gelding is. A gelding is a male horse that's been castrated. Okay. What that meant is that the Comanche Indians knew how to handle horses well enough that they could castrate stud colts. Not easy. None of the other tribes did that. They hadn't, they hadn't identified that a castrated male is more dependable, essentially as strong, more tractable, um, less, less likely to kill you or your neighbor or your kid when he gets out in the herd. Mm -hmm. A gelding, you get more work out of a gelding, mm -hmm. especially in a wartime situation. The rest of the story, according to the author, is that they were developing their own bloodlines. They were practicing true horse management. They were yeah. managing their horse herd, and that they had 15,000 horses, and horses were the wealth of the plains. They had more horses than anybody else. Yeah. And so that, there was, all, do you remember the eyewitness account of, of some Anglo, some white guy who was with them on some basis, who watched them capture a herd of wild horses? Yeah, actually. That they sort of, they drove this herd of wild horses. Wild horses are truly wild into this box canyon. Now that's a classic Western sort of mm -hmm. motif of here's how you catch wild horses. You drive them into a box canyon. 
But the Indians did this. They had all these warriors lying in wait with their leather ropes. About 80, I think he said, horses went into this box canyon, and only one got away. They caught every other horse with ropes. The one that got away, a couple guys jumped on their ponies, ran that horse down and roped him. And then the eyewitness account of, of breaking those things, mm -hmm. they would rope them, a, a, a rope around the neck, choke them out till they ran out of oxygen and collapsed to the ground. Then when the horse, they would slack the rope and when the horse would regain his senses, the blood would get back up into his brain. He'd get to his feet and fight the rope until they choked him out. Bam, he's on the ground. At some point, the horse is standing there shaking, scared to death, um, ready to be taught. And one of those guys would go up and breathe into his nostrils to where the only air that horse was getting, which he had learned to treasure, air, was completely um, the scent of that human. And this guy said that after they had done that, they could put a, a, I forget what you call it, it's a loop in the bottom jaw of the horse that substitutes for a bridle, and jump on his back. Mm -hmm. Now that staggers me, and any other horseman is going to be crying BS on that. But, I mean, he had no reason to lie. And yeah. the fact was they could really ride. Uh, in terms of connecting the dots historically, it was so eye-opening to realize that the settlers coming into the plains at that time had Kentucky rifles. And that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And the Indians had bows and arrows. And so it seems obvious to, you know, initially, like, well, you know, yeah. I had a knife to a gunfight. Well, yeah. yeah. It's, it, was, it, it was the exact opposite. These so settlers could get one, maybe two shots off. It takes a minute to reload. Yeah. If they didn't hit, the Indians were on them because they're on their horses and be firing from the horses, riding circles around their targets. Under the horse's neck. Yeah, sliding. Yeah, they, they would slide and hang and shoot from under the horses, which I think the Mongols did as well. Yeah. But basically, in terms of uh, the, the arms and the technology, the war technology, the Indians were actually far superior, yeah. like miles superior to miles. these settlers, even though they had guns and, and forts in a few instances. Mm -hmm. That was that was kind of shocking to me. I did not realize that. And the, the thing that shocked me was coming from the East, where the conflict between Native Americans and white settlers was all done on foot. Yes. You're all running back and forth through the brush yeah. on foot. The flintlock, the rifle was a big advantage. Yeah. Right. But out there on the plains, the the white guys, intent on recapturing their people or whatever they were doing, would find the, the Indians, tie their horses up, sneak in there in their moccasins or whatever with their flintlocks. Everybody would take their shot. Instantly they're identified. Some portion of the Indians would ride around them, pick up their trail, ride back to where their horses were, steal the horses. So now the guys are on foot and they have this ring of Indians round and around and around shooting three and four and five arrows. D did you read that, that they would get multiple arrows into the air before the first one made contact? Uh, it's possible. Uh, it was kind of, it's all kind of so, uh, it's possible. It, it could have been either way. There's, there should, certainly they were losing 10 per minute or some yeah. huge number, yeah, 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 you yeah. know? Yeah. Rapid fire. Yeah. On an automatic basis. Right. And all you could see to shoot at was their heel, their heel hooked onto the wither of the horse yeah. and that's it. And yeah. they would just decimate. Yeah. And anybody that was left alive regretted it. So this, it's funny. We think of all of the geography in terms of states and the country, but the plains at that time were their own country. And the author yeah. called it Coman. Cheria. Yeah, yeah, Comancheria. Yeah. And it's a fun way to think about it because you had Mexico and the Spanish were, you know, in control. You had the French over in the Gulf and Florida, yeah, maybe. Up the Mississippi corridor, yeah. Right. And in the east, you know, it was all long since settled. But that 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 Texas and Oklahoma, all the way up to Utah, really. All, all the way to Canada. All the way to Canada. Yeah. yeah was all the the Comancheria, the country of the Comanches and yeah. and 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 they, and basically, people just decided we're not going there anymore. They tried for decades. They tried and got pushed back and pushed back. So here, here was one of the revelations to me. I always kind of wondered why didn't Spain continue their conquest? I mean, Central America, Mexico, Texas, California, stop. Yeah. Okay. And they were competing with France, right? Both in Europe and in the New World. 
and and then Spain just kind of how did that work? Well, yeah. it worked like that because of the Comanches. The Comanches isolated them in their forts, made them utterly irrelevant, yeah. stole their horses, and finally the Spaniards just gave up because their armor, their gunpowder, their swords were useless and they retreated back to Mexico. Okay? Yeah. And then, so that answered that for me. I never really understood why. Now I know the Comanches stopped Spain. And then I often wondered, well, what was the deal with the Anglos moving into Texas and kind of having this thing with Mexico and Santa Ana? And, and Mexico invited the Anglos into Texas to serve as a buffer between yeah. them and the Comanches. Yeah. We'll put up a, somebody else for them to kill and steal from yeah. because we can't stop them. Because according to the author, the Comanches dismissively referred to the people in Mexico as their livestock keepers. Yeah. <laughs> they would feed and water the horses and cattle that they wanted, and then they would go down and take them when they wanted. Yeah. Amazing. It's re it really is. Now, the, the main character in the book, or certainly the character we know the most about, is Quanah Parker. So let's talk about this guy for a few minutes. Oh. And he was the last chief of the Comanches. He was born... At when they were at their prime, in their zenith, to Cynthia Ann Parker, Cynthia Ann Parker, a white settler who had been taken captive, I think, at the age of nine, nine years old, little girl captured, and he was one of her children, so half Indian, half white, which was actually a stigma that that uh, he had to deal with. Anyways, it's the story of him, and holy smokes, the the guy, uh, yeah, true American hero. I guess. True American hero, and it's hard. You, you you got to read this book just to get an understanding of this of this man. And we can talk for a few minutes, but this might be where we leave a little for the yeah. for the readers. But uncommon, just such an uncommon. Yeah, Quana was, I think, twelve years old when his mother was taken. So his white mom was That's taken right. by. Uh, some soldiers. She was rescued. Rescued. Right? Yeah. yeah. And half his village killed. I think his father was killed maybe yeah. just before that or maybe in that same raid. I, I can't so. remember. Mm -hmm. And he was, his father was a chief. So and I guess. big guy. So yeah. So this, uh, this family DNA of the, these, this Parker clan, this white woman marries and is the, the chief of this tribe. Mm -hmm. um, her son then is an orphan and his mom is gone. So he's 12. He has a little brother and yeah. he is a half Mexican, which to some Mexican, sorry, half uh, Anglo, half Anglo. Yeah. Uh, so to some extent, it, the author describes it, that that was a stigma and he was not favored in the in the community yeah. for that. Yeah. So he's in a strange tribe, orphaned from a from a from another tribe, half white, not an easy life. And and climbs from there through his, I guess you'd say, teenage years from the time he's 12 to 19 to where he's one of the more powerful war chiefs yeah. with his own huge herd of horses. And it's just an incredible, that, that alone, that, that yeah. turn from a, an orphan outcast to a, a war chief of great standing in the tribe is already an amazing kind of tale. Like, wow, I wonder how that happened. The, and the last war chief of the Comanches. Yes. And then later, and this is really the, the crux of the book, the Comanches surrender to the, government i guess they retire to fort sill uh Kwana leads the tribe there and brings them in brings them in and then and then completely you, there's no other word completely adopts a a white american lifestyle in every way mm -hmm. politic he gets involved in politics and goes to dc lobbying and he secures uh, resources for his people and friends and himself. I he's mean, on a school board. On, he's on a, a school, school board. on the reservation for the Indian <laughs> yeah. kids. He just so, and not only does he adopt the lifestyle, but he dominates. He's, he excels. Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. And he this takes guy. care of his people. Yeah, I mean, he, he he accumulates wealth and then spends it taking care of his people. To where when he dies, it's all been spent, and he's had people camping around his house. Yeah, for the last yeah, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. I thought that was pretty neat. That, that twice in this guy's life, he goes from nothing to yeah. the top, and man, what what a what a guy! And we have there's beautiful pictures of him. He's just so handsome, striking, so striking, and he, wisely as he becomes incorporated into the you know American community, he kind of stops talking about the raids and the scalpings and all the things oh. that were a part of his oh. life fully. 
And I mean, just talk about street smarts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? talk about street smarts. So w- one of the things that just struck me, you're talking about that, is the, the dichotomy of Comanche emotion. You know, the, the author describes what they do in their raids, and they, they used terrorism as a war tactic to try to terrify the advancing um, white adversary. And, well, they did it to the Indian tribes that they obliterated, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, they just were hardball players, as hard hardball as anybody has ever played, mm-hmm. probably. But they were tender at home, to the point that Cynthia Parker, so she was captured, maybe she was in her mid-30s or something. Well, he was 12, she was yeah, taken 9. I, I, I think he might have been 29. I don't know why I'm 29. That, but not very old. She mourned. She mutilated herself. She yeah. tried to escape over and over <laughs> yeah. and over. She wanted to go back. Yeah. She only wanted one thing in her new life back with her family. The Parker clan took her back in and tried to figure out how to relate to her. Yeah. She spent what was left of her short remaining years trying to get back to the, her <laughs> life on the plains with the Comanches. Yeah. And that just struck me. That helped me think in a new way of the power of culture mm-hmm. and what culture does to us on the inside and how it changes us and molds us and how hard it is to be happy in any other culture than our own. I really enjoyed that as well. And I was especially moved with this tribe who is killing women, children, babies, torture, rape, kill, all all of the worst things you can do. Yeah. And at home, and he talked about the ways that they, you know, showed love in their family and, and like the, it was a, it just read in the, in the author's words and also in the writings of the individuals we have, like they, you know, they, they loved their families. They cared about their village and their people and all the, the deepest core values were actually shared. Yeah. Which is pretty yeah. surprising. Cause like, wow, that's how could you possibly share anything? And yet at home, you know, when the dust all settles, everybody's taking care of their kids and enjoying their family and all that. And it was even for me more than that, because the Wadsworths are kind of a bottled up bunch. We are not emotionally all that open. Okay. Some of us more than others. But those je- those Comanche men, barbaric to the max in war, to the max. I mean, taking an arrow and using the navel of a pregnant woman on the ground as a target. Try to hit her in the navel, mm-hmm. okay? But at home, they would laugh and they would sing and they would fall asleep sometimes singing. And practical jokes and yeah. just a light spontaneous engaged living at home was uh, yeah. w- what a what a contrast there were accounts in the book also that were not in the author's words but details from journals of Comanche mothers illustrating how well and how much they loved and took care of even adopted uh, children and yeah. how much they and, you know the mothering instincts and and motherhood exactly the way I see and experience yep. it happening in their Comanche villages. And I was, yep. I was kind of moved and sort of like, oh my goodness, these yep. are, these are, these are human beings. <laughs> and, and that was something that Quana would speak to when he, after he was in and he was wearing a Stetson and a wool suit and went down into Texas again, mm-hmm. still the sovereign country of Texas where he had been a terrorist and speaking to, to buildings that are full of people now wanting to hear him speak, he would say, we are all the same people. Yeah. This is something that he would say to the people that had been his adversary. We are all the same people because he had received this insight. Yeah. And, and he would know. He would know. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, truly he, he, he would know. And he was, he was, and is so right about that. Yeah. Okay. And that brings up the last point that I want to mention about the book. When I started, I had an idea in my mind, like I mentioned from popular culture and movies about being an Indian and what that was like. And within the first chapter, that was shattered. Mm-hmm. For some reason, it, I never realized the the extent of the torture and rape that was yeah. present among these Indian raids. Mm-hmm. And and this author doesn't you know hide any of that. And so I was very quickly kind of like putting myself in the shoes of the settlers. Wow, yeah, no wonder you would shoot any Indian before they could, you could even like, yeah. you know, see the, see them why wouldn't you and, and so very quickly that was kind of my my thought like holy i'm i'm terrified and then by the middle of the book you start realizing wow this is so complicated yeah because the 
the government and these Indian reservations were so terrible and corrupt. Terrible. So many lies told to the Indian chiefs that were almost instantaneously, uh, you know, discarded. Yeah. The, you know, we, we know that the, con- the the land was taken and they were kicked off. But when I read about the buffalo being massacred and how that was as much a political move as anything else, mm-hmm. I was, I was thinking and just kind of feeling so much differently about the whole situation yeah, yeah. wow and then by the end of the book it was pretty obvious like wow yeah we we basically i say we but the you know the settlers did to the comanches what the comanches did to the apaches <laughs> and these other tribes and man looking back what a what a complicated and and tragic event but i kind of was feeling like almost like weather it's like oh this is like like a devastating weather event like yeah what else could happen here and i don't yeah. i don't know i don't know if there's maybe there's writings about how this could have been solved in other ways and that would no. be an interesting place to learn more yeah this sc gwyn that's his name right yeah i was just dazzled at how even-handedly yeah and without any regard to political correctness he just communicated the history of of the collision that happened in Texas, yeah. Um, I, so I just I just salute him. I've never read anything about the American West as comprehensive as that over mm-hmm. that one little segment. Uh, so rewinding the tape a little bit, I was struck at the difference in the description of the details in the Comanche family life and some of the details in the Parker family life. And the Comanche family seemed more functional in mm-hmm. terms of the family itself. Mm. I, I, or at least I was kind of projecting, I guess, I'm not sure what I was projecting, but I was, I was uh, moved by how functional their family cultures were, yeah. at least as well as it could be communicated. You yeah. know, who knows? Yeah. Who, who knows? But it was, it was, it was juxtaposed with when a white slave would be brought in the brutal treatment. They would have their faces thrust into a fire until their noses were burned off yeah. as a discipline. Yeah. But, but then when Cynthia went back to the Parker family, the way that they with a clear conscience sort of restrained and could not understand and couldn't even try to understand her pain yeah. was an interesting contrast in inability to understand or value another person's pain which that was kind of a, a, at a cultural level, looking from the outside, saying, well, I can see how your culture would make it impossible for you to recognize the reality of that other person's pain. Yeah. So it, it was, oh, and then the, the last thing that, that I just was struck by, you know, the mythology around the Texas Rangers. Yeah. Yeah, Those, that, was, that was neat. That was neat. Yeah. They were, they, they, they were kind of had two different incarnations, they were kind of a ragtag sim- sort of criminal bunch at one point and a very well organized and effective bunch at another point but the takeaway of the book was for me well that's an overstatement mm-hmm. but i remember the author talking about how tough and and um, integrated with the plains environment the comanches were mm-hmm. that they could when facing star when facing death by thirst or if on the run from an enemy so there was no time to go to a water hole they could drink the liquid out of the paunch of a dead horse as a way to stay alive. Mm-hmm. And no Texas Ranger, he said, was ever that tough. Yeah. Last last thing I'll say here, when you read a book like this and read any history, you, you look at cultures as a whole and people, but it's important to remember that these were also individuals. And so you think about that, that white girl who had her face burned off and everything, you know, there was there was some individual who did that. And yes to assume or, or broadcast that upon all of the Comanches right. is not fair because some of those, you know, Comanche mothers and Kwana, you know, was a different type of person. Different. And yet we, all we can do is look at the historical accounts we have and say, well, that, we know that happened. We know that happened. I guess I was feeling kind of sad that th- there's not more journals and history and yeah. photographs and information available. You think about what's lost um, from that culture. Yeah, and and, fr- and from the settlers for that matter also, but yeah. we're looking back at this with not, I don't know. It's, we have a lot of information, and at the same time, so much happened that is just gone forever. And yeah. I remember thinking that's a little sad, and and some of them not as serious of points. But there was one account. You remember it was some battle, battle of 
can't remember. I can't remember, but somebody happened to see a, what was that big gun they had? It wasn't a 30 millimeter. At one point they rolled out these like little mini cannons yep. and brought them to, <laughs> brought them on the planes. And it was the first time the Indians yeah. had experience with this. And they were shooting grape shot. They were know, shooting like, grape shot. It was, it was insane. And at one point they shot right through a horse that a, an Indian was riding on. Yes. And, as, and the guy j- journaled that went right clear through the horse and the guy flew off. And, you know, you even think about events like that, you know, just unbelievable things and instances that happen that are just gone and, yeah. you know, good and bad. Yeah. But in, point being, individuals on, on all sides of history there that that were making probably really brave and noble and yes. honorable decisions yes. and also terrible, evil and horrendous ones that, you know, even at the time, maybe even in that tribe, there would have been some, a lot of debate about it. Who, who knows? that Maybe that's even romanticizing it too much. Who knows? Good thing we have what we have, I guess. Yeah, you know, the, they had no government to speak of. A war chief would emerge by however many guys he could talk into following him on a raid that seemed to him to be a good idea. Yeah, you yeah, know? that's right. That's and, it. That was wasn't the whole even a chief because the, the, Kiwana was the only chief to be a chief of all the Comanches. Only time and it that had ever happened. basically only happened when he brought them into Fort yeah. Sill. I, I had equal impulse to be appalled and saddened both of the things I read about how Indians treated their adversaries and how the white people treated their adversaries. Yeah. Just, just, just the worst. Yeah. Just the worst. And I could yeah. understand both. Yeah. I, at least I flatter myself that I had some understanding of both impulses. Yeah. But anyway, I, I'll never forget the book and I may read it again. Yeah. I hope you all uh, check it out. My next step with this, I've heard and I, I, saw the video but i know joe rogan did an interview with the author mm-hmm. yeah and had a conversation so i'm gonna go there next and i'd love to hear more out of uh, both of them about their thoughts on it because really fun book i hope you all check it out the next book that we're gonna do we've got two and we'll put these in the description i'm not sure which order they're gonna be but we're reading the rational optimist this is by matt ridley how prosperity evolves and we are reading How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes by Peter D. Schiff. This is a little bit, this looks, it's got a lot of drawings in here. It's not, it's not a comic, but it should be an easy read. So if you want to read those now, you will avoid getting anything spoiled. Although these are certainly not books where things can be spoiled because these are much more nuts and bolts kind of uh, informational books as opposed to any type of story. Yeah. So yeah. All right, anything, any final thoughts to add to this discussion? Don't mess with Texas. Yeah, Texas, man, I, I, I still know nothing about Texas, but it makes sense how there's so much pride in oh, Texas for man. their for their culture there. Yeah, you know, if, if you were a Texan and you read this book and you informed yourself about the Battle of San Jacinto and, mm-hmm. and just that whole thing, you couldn't stop being proud of where you're from. Oh, that's the point I was going to make about the Parkers in terms of people being individuals. You think about how different that family was from every other family in the country that they were willing to go deeper into the Comanche territory than anybody had ever gone and build a homestead. I mean, that, that was not a normal person at all that. So in terms of their family culture and like, without a doubt, those were some unique and way different people than everybody else. So, and not necessarily nice, certainly not, you know, just, Tough people. It yeah. was a collision of tough people. Yeah, that's our, it. Our yeah. ancestors, everyone behind us, if they lived to maturity, were tough people. And so when these cultures collided, bad things happened. Oh, that was another thought. I was constantly reminded how how all of the characters in this book, these item, these things were happening to them in their twenties and thirties, primarily, yeah. Yeah. and very often, like with the Indians, it, as they were teenagers, and just. Talk about culture different. I mean, our our teenagers aren't even rolling out of bed, and yeah. our twenty year olds are. I, I don't even know what you know. Not to like slur. I know most of you are are great, but there's a lot of twenty year olds who are don't consider themselves an adult yet. Let me put it that way. There's a lot of twenty year olds who don't consider themselves an adult even until they're like thirty. And so, or how about holy this? Smokes. Consider themselves entitled to make an adult's choices without having to be responsible for an adult's responsibility. But Quana at 12 had the responsibility for his survival and survival of his brother in an incredibly hostile environment. Yeah. And he pulled it off. I, was, I mean, I'm 37 and I was, there was, I think, Sol Ross, I can't remember the, some some captain, you know, leading the settler army was yeah. 
basically retiring at 37 and had been in like eight different yeah. wars and had it was torn up it was torn up his he was what he had been through at that point in his life i mean it, it and me thinking about myself and i've you know i'm a fully grown adult but i instantly felt like a little boy <laughs> thinking about what this guy had yeah. experienced by that age in his life so it's a it's a difference of cultures i guess we can't expect the same thing of our children today but and the book doesn't judge the cultures it just tells the story yeah hope you all check it out thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time